Good evening and a warm welcome to you all. And it will be a warm area tonight because it's very cosy. Um, I think Barry will be overwhelmed by the response tonight. And he has offered to repeat this session for anyone who doesn't get um, or hear it all, especially those at the back. He's making rude gestures to me down the back here. My name is Rhonda, and I'm probably one of the newest um, community educators here tonight. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome um, Barry Snow. I'm just learning about what he's into and what he's doing. So I would like to introduce him tonight. Barry is a neurologist at Auckland Hospital. He specialises in the treatment and research of Parkinson's disease. And he works with a team of nurses, doctors and other staff in the Movement Disorder Clinic. This team carried out the first study of pig cell transplant for Parkinson's disease. And tonight he's going to talk about treatment for Parkinson's disease, particularly transplantation. So I'd like you to give him a warm welcome, Barry Snow. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me down the back? Can you? That's loud enough? Oh, good. Oh, well, thanks for coming. Uh, you always have regrets, don't we? I only wish I'd sold tickets to the New York. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's always really hard to know how much interest these things will get. So, um, like, like Wanda said, um, we're quite happy to do the talk again for those of you out the back who, who want to go or just can't hear. So, sorry about that. It's, we're beaten up by the dermatologists, all those people next door with the beautiful skin here. <coughs> So, so the topic tonight is Parkinson's disease and uh, next year will be the 200th anniversary of the original essay by James Parkinson. So he was a doctor, uh, lived in London, uh, the son of a surgeon, he was a physician like me, don't operate, and uh, he was an amazing guy. He described all sorts of things, uh, mostly non-medical. He wrote the main textbooks about ancient fossils, he wrote uh, the main chemistry school book for teaching boys chemistry. And he wrote uh, one of the first descriptions of appendicitis with his father. He was a, a political activist. He uh, came very close to being hung, drawn and quartered uh, along with uh, Guy Fawkes uh, for anti-government activity. And he only got involved with Parkinson's once. He, uh, he described six patients in this, this beautiful description of the disease two of them who he saw on the street, and he went up to them and said, um, I know what you've got, it's a shaking palsy, we can't cure it, so don't bother going to see a doctor. <laughs> <coughs> and then he disappeared from this, we don't have a photograph of him, so if you think we've, you've seen a photo of James Parkinson's, it's not him. The Parkinson tulip was actually named after a different Parkinson, so it's not even Parkinson's tulip, um, but that doesn't mean we don't grab hold of it. So, so that's the, the background, but he recognised something that I think we all do. Um, an older person, a few more men than women, a tendency to stoop, have the hands out in front, and it's quite a distinctive feature that we call Parkinsonism. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do tonight is tell you a little bit about the background and the pathology of the disease to help you understand what's going on inside your head. Uh, a bit about the current treatments that we use for Parkinson's, and then move on into some of the more radical treatments that we're thinking about, some of the transplant therapy. And I know a lot of you want to know about the pig cell transplant work that we've been doing at Auckland Hospital, and that's how we're going to round up the talk. So about 100 years ago, it was recognised uh, some of the pathology in Parkinson's disease. So this is a slice through the base of the brain where the two big hemispheres joined onto the spinal cord. And the top one's normal, and there's little black crescents you there. You can see there, it's called the substantia nigra. And about 100 years ago, it was recognized that instead of being black, it was pale. And that was the only pathology recognized in Parkinson's disease. When people started to look under a microscope at the little cells in that black area, 
in normal people they could see melanin and in people with Parkinson's that melanin had gone and melanin the same uh, pigment that gives color to our skin is made out of dopamine which is the main chemical that is deficient in Parkinson's disease. Now once better microscopes were developed it was recognized that in these nerves that are dying in Parkinson's a little round structures that I've got my finger pointing towards and those are called Lewy bodies and that Lewy body is an important feature that I'm going to go on and describe in a few minutes. So about a hundred years ago we knew that the substantia nigra had gone pale, that these nerves had disappeared and inside these nerves were these little things called Lewy bodies that had clearly something to do with the disease. And at that time the only way you could see Lewy bodies was to stain them in a certain way uh, and so-called H&E stain and the Lewy bodies are only ever seen in this part of the brain so they're thought to be t totally distinctive for Parkinson's disease. Now there's that part of the brain again, it looks a little bit like Mickey Mouse with the two ears and that's the top of the spinal cord and these are the structures going up to join onto the hemispheres and in this brain here you can just see the little dark stains particularly this side of that substantia narco. So we know that person uh, who owned this brain uh, didn't have Parkinson's disease. Now, the nerves that start there are about two centimeters long and they go up into the central part of the brain, an area here called the basal ganglia. And this is the area where these nerves end up. And this is where the action is in Parkinson's. So the nerves start there but the end of the nerve is in the right in the middle of the brain, the area called the basal ganglia, which is a word that you might know. It's also called the putamen, which is important because that's where we do the transplants for Parkinson's. Now, <clears throat> if you go down with a, an electron microscope to tiny, tiny scale, you'll find the nerve ending, which is going from the substantia nigra, which will be a kilometer or two that way, if we shrunk it up to size or it's up to size and this is what's going on in the basal ganglia and these nerves have a natural existing chemical called levodopa which we've all got in our brains and that's the same chemical that's in cinnamon or madapa that you take for your Parkinson's and this chemical levodopa is naturally converted inside the nerve to dopamine and when a nerve impulse comes down the nerve it tells the nerve to release the dopamine which goes to stimulate the next nerve and sends the message on. So in Parkinson's, this is the nerve that's dying out. It's the one that comes from the black body. And because it's dying out, there's not enough dopamine. Because there's not enough dopamine, it's not stimulating the next nerve. And that's the basic chemical problem in Parkinson's. Almost. And I'll come back to almost in a moment. <coughs> now, when I went to medical school, and when most of the medical people and nursing people and clinicians in this room were trained, we were told a very simple story about Parkinson's, which in retrospect is just astonishing, but here we go. Uh, we were told that there was probably one cause, and when I started doing research in Parkinson's about 30 years ago, we were looking for the cause for Parkinson's. Never found it. Uh, we thought that the only thing that was really wrong was this deficiency in the dopamine in that part of the brain. And we thought that Parkinson's gives you stiffness and slowness and a bit of loss of balance. And therefore, replacing the dopamine would fix that, end of story. Now, I just don't know what we were seeing then, but that's what we believed and that's how the story was. For example, we were taught that nobody with Parkinson's had problems with thinking. <laughs> and I guess what happens is when we saw people with Parkinson's who had trouble with thinking, we thought it was something else. And it's amazing how you can be blinded to things. And so we had this very simple view of Parkinson's, which meant that it was a very simple thing to look after it. You kind of gave the person the cinema or matter power and cheerio. Uh, and there wasn't the importance that we now recognize about looking after so many aspects of the disease. And we were blinded very much to what else was going on, and we were blinded very much by like, trying to find a single cause. Now let me take you back to this diagram which I've shown you before and talk about this thing, the Lewy body, because 
Turning, no. or understanding the Lewy body better has completely changed our view of Parkinson's. So we always knew that Lewy body was there, but we never knew what it was made of. Until a, a sort of a dramatic sequence of events occurred. Most Parkinson's is, uh, is uh, isolated. So in the sense of if you've got Parkinson's, relatively low chance of one of your family members having it. But we've always known about a few genetic families with very strong family trees of Parkinson's. And there's a family in, uh, in Italy and America, so-called Contursi family, named after the town they came from, with a very strongly inherited version of Parkinson's disease. And because there's such a strong family tree, it was possible to take blood samples and look at the genes and bit by bit, working their way back, and found the genetic cause of this sort of Parkinson's. It's a very rare sort of Parkinson's. I've never seen it. Just a few families with it in the world. But once they'd found the gene, they were able to go back in the test tube and work backwards and figure out what this gene made. Oops, goodness me. You've seen the end of my talk. <laughs> and this gene makes a protein called alpha-synuclein. And it's such an important part of Parkinson's that we are starting to call it in the in scientific world an alpha-synucleinopathy, just to make it harder. <coughs> but the important thing is that once the scientists or we had figured out that this Contursi family, their, they, their uh, gene was coding for alpha-synuclein, it was possible to make a stain or a detector for this alpha-synuclein and the scientists went back and stained the brains of the Contursi family and they found Lewy bodies which were glowing bright with alpha-synuclein. Their Lewy bodies were made of alpha-synuclein. And so then the scientists started looking at people's brains without that gene defect and guess what? All Lewy bodies are full of alpha-synuclein. So that one small discovery in that one tiny family which discovered the gene for that small family and then what that gene made brought us back to understanding that the basis for Parkinson's is an abnormal accumulation of this protein called alpha-synuclein. And that's got tremendous implications for many aspects of Parkinson's. Now one of the most important discoveries from the alpha-synuclein working back is that once you start staining for alpha-synuclein using this modern stain, you turn up Lewy bodies all over the place all through the brain, depending upon what version of Parkinson's you've got. So if you've just got the physical stiffness, slowness, it's here. If you've lost your sense of smell, which most of you have, it's here in the smell part of the brain. If it's down here, you wake up in the middle of the night and punch your wife in your sleep. Ever done that? Yes. <laughs> Called REM sleep behavior disorder. And if you're not thinking straight, the Lewy bodies are over the cortex. So you can actually map out where the Lewy bodies are in people's brains. This is after they've died. But when you work back, you can tell the pattern of Parkinson's they had. So the pattern of Parkinson's is determined by the distribution of these Lewy bodies. And guess what? Many of you would have had trouble with constipation years before the onset of your Parkinson's. Well, there have been studies now where, of people who have got Parkinson's who in the past had a colonoscopy with a biopsy of their bowel. And if you look at that early bowel biopsy when they had the colonoscopy for constipation only, Lewy bodies all through the gut as well. So Parkinson's is not just a brain disease. And in case you hadn't noticed already, it's a total body disease. And you knew that all along, but it took the Contursi family with that gene with the alpha-synuclein, with the stain, with the Lewy body, to piece the whole story together and make it into a much clearer picture of what's going on. And don't forget the Contursi family's got this gene defect which is incredibly rare. And as we've looked and looked, we've found more and more genes that causes Parkinson's. But it can't just be genetic, because most of you have got Parkinson's just by yourselves or maybe with one other family member. So there's clearly something in the environment as well. And so we're starting to realise that Parkinson's doesn't have a cause. And we're quite used to this in other diseases. For in heart disease, we know that you're more likely to have heart disease if you've got a family history, if you're a smoker, if you've got high blood pressure, 
if your diet's lousy, you know, too many <coughs> pies, for example. And, um, and if you've got this combination of factors, you're more likely to get heart disease. And almost certainly we're going to find out that certain combinations of genes and probably environmental factors all pieced together will increase or decrease your risk of getting Parkinson's. And then probably on top of that is just going to be plain bad luck that this combination of factors somehow gel and off the Parkinson's goes. <coughs> so I showed you that simple diagram before. Well, it's got a whole lot simpler, yeah. <coughs> so this is more how we think about Parkinson's now. That there are probably multiple causes. Quite a few of them are genes, but it's combinations of genes. And some of it's environment as well. So you don't necessarily inherit Parkinson's, but you inherit a tendency that sets you up for Parkinson's. And, and that's a very common thing. So from my parents, I inherited pale skin and red hair, a bit of Scottish and Irish blood. And if I get too much sunshine, I'll get skin cancer. But I didn't inherit the skin cancer. I inherited a genetic makeup, which when it interacts with an environmental factor, will trigger, in my case, a skin cancer. And probably Parkinson's is like that. We still believe that there's probably some common factor in the middle that goes on that takes all these risk factors and converts all that alpha synuclein into those Lewy bodies which then starts attacking the nerves. But we haven't quite understood that factor yet, but I'll come down to it. And then, instead of this old idea of a dopamine deficiency and the stiffness and slowness and tremor making the Parkinson's, we realize that depending where the Lewy bodies are, you'll get different troubles with your thinking and sleep disturbance, mood disorders, pain, falls, and this autonomic dysfunction is your bladder and your bowel and that tendency to get funny sweats and feel hot when you shouldn't. So Parkinson's has moved from a simple concept to a whole body concept. We still don't know what this is and we haven't been out, figured out how to get rid of the cause, so the treatment of Parkinson's is still attending to everything. And this is why Parkinson's has moved away from a single doctor treating disorder into the concept of a team. And we're very much of the view now that you need a team to look after you. Now, this is my 20th anniversary of working with Lorraine McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is another part of the story which is fantastic in Parkinson's, that uh, 20 years ago, uh, I was doing some research with a company and we used the money to employ the first Parkinson's nurse. Lorraine was already a very senior nurse at Auckland Hospital, but she chose to, to take this on. And then by proving the worth of a Parkinson's nurse, that, uh, that role has become established and grown. And, and now Lorraine has a, has a huge body of knowledge, and just, I just heard a moment ago how much difference she's made to so many people's lives. So we work closely as a team now. So we have a surgeon, Mr. Bock, who does uh, the deep brain stimulation, Lorraine, who does the Parkinson's nurse, we have psychology, and we also work out into the community as well, and which is why Parkinson's New Zealand is such an important organisation, because we've, we've realised that you can't do these things by themselves. One of the things that we've consciously done when we've taken on research projects at the Auckland Movement sort of group is that we've recognised that research often doesn't produce the answer we want. Okay? You already saw my last slide, you know, we kick at the goal and we miss. And so we do our best to make sure that each research study, one way or another, puts back a whole lot of good into the system, and we particularly use research money to make sure that we can employ staff who make a difference. And uh, it's really exciting because this year with the pig cell study, we've used the money to employ another Parkinson's nurse. Adele, stand up. <laughs> <coughs> And so, you know, can't have too many Lorraines. So <laughs> and so we're, we're using the, the money, if, even if the study doesn't work out, we'll use it to do some good in other ways. So let's move on from this one. Now, don't concentrate too hard on the slide, except to, except to feel slightly confused here. You looking at that and feeling confused? Good, good, you've got the message. <laughs> we know that the Lewy bodies are caused by some complicated way in which the nerves uh, get rid of dead or useless protein. And, it's, and we think Lewy bodies are best thought of as a garbage bag full of alpha-synuclein you don't want anymore, a rubbish bag. And we think what happens in the brain is the whole system that gets rid of bad proteins 
somehow misfires or fails and the Lewy bodies build up, the alpha synuclein builds up and we think that's the basis for what's going on and we're pretty sure that's a problem with a process called oxidation because normally we get rid of proteins with an oxidative process and when it breaks down that's what seems to cause this build up. And so you might say, well, that's simple. Why don't you use an antioxidant? And for years we used coenzyme Q10, vitamin E, vitamin C, and then a New Zealand-made drug called mitoquinone, which I know some of you took about 10 years ago as a part of a research study. Um, but none of those seem to work. Certainly the mitoquinone didn't work. So we still have a fair idea what's going on here, some oxidative process, but we don't know the answer. But probably, ultimately, one of the answers to Parkinson's will be to work out this mechanism and somehow stop the formation of the alpha synuclein. Probably quite a few know that in, uh, in Austria now there's actually a vaccination against alpha synuclein, the idea that we can get the body to reject the Lewy bodies. I have to say that seems like a long shot to me because it might be like breaking down the garbage bag and you're just going to get rubbish strewn everywhere. <laughs> so. Uh, so there's a lot of unease about that research line, but, it, but people are still heading down the line of trying to get rid of the Lewy bodies or trying to get rid of the alpha synuclein. Now, I can't go past this. <coughs> Probably the most exciting development in the treatment of Parkinson's in the last two years has been the simplest one, which has been the recognize, recognition that exercise and activity is probably the most important treatment after, uh, after dopamine. Okay. It seems to be more powerful than uh, the other drugs like ropinirole and pergolide and um, if you get it right it's probably more pleasant too. Now this is just one of the many pieces of data showing very strong relationships between activity and, uh, and uh, improvement in Parkinson's. This is a really interesting study. This is the activity that you do when you're not exercising. Okay, so if you lie around all day and just go to the gym, it's not enough. The rest of the day you've got to do something as well. And we're really seeing that actually since we've concentrated harder on exercise, how what a transformative effect it's got on people. And I, know, I see a number of people around the room who I know who have actually told that to me, how, how if they go to the gym or not, they have a good day or not. And if I was going to leave you with one practical message from tonight, it'll be of how much difference exercise makes. Now, all of you enthusiastic daughters with 85-year-old tuckered-out dads who've got Parkinson's, that does not mean whipping them around the block five <laughs> times a day, okay? <laughs> the rule is that the amount of exercise you do is the amount you can do again tomorrow, okay? And if you can't get them out of bed tomorrow, you've probably pushed them too hard. So. <laughs> okay, I've accused you of punching your wife, but get your daughter off your back, so. Very dangerous having daughters. Now, I want to go back to this diagram before. Remember I showed you this picture of the nerve in the base of the brain and how we own, have our own levodopa that we make into dopamine and it stimulates? Well, when these nerves die down, we're short on dopamine. And the miracle of Parkinson's disease is that we can replace the missing dopamine with tablets. Not as dopamine, but as levodopa. And levodopa is the active compound in the pills that most of you take, the cinnamon or the matapa. And the people who worked that out got a Nobel Prize, and that seems fair enough to me. So the other really interesting development over the last five or ten years is the rehabilitation of levodopa. It was the original anti-Parkinsonian drug, um, getting on to 50, 60 years ago, and it's still the best. And it's not surprising it's the best because it's the natural product. Uh, there's been, it's got a bad press for a long time about uh, harming people or, or causing more harm than good. But in fact, all of that's been disproven and it's now back at the number one spot as the best treatment alongside exercise. Now, <clears throat> but it's not simple and, and there's a really complicated thing that happens with levodopa and this graph <laughs> illustrates that and I'll talk your way through it. This is hours along this axis and the yellow line is the amount of dopa in your blood after you take a cinnamon or a matapar tablet. It builds up and it's pretty much gone by two or three hours. But in the first few years of the disease, what people notice is that the beneficial effects, which is the light blue line, lasts all day. In fact, sometimes it lasts so well that the person doesn't even know if the dope is working. The family sees it and the doctor sees it, but the person says, I just feel normal. If I skip a pill, I don't notice it, and if I'm late for my pill, I don't notice that either. 
Remember that? Yeah, yeah in the old days? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and the reason for that is this little re-round things at the end of the nerve. They're called vesicles, and basically they're storage systems. So while the dopa comes and goes in the blood in a few hours, it gets stored in these nerves and can last 8 or 10 or 12 hours. That's why one tablet can last for so long. This is in the first few years of the disease, and they call it the honeymoon period for a good reason, because it's just terrific, but then it doesn't last. Because unfortunately, the same system that's storing that dopamine is the same system that's affected by those Lewy bodies that's damaging those nerves. And bit by bit, the storage system breaks down, and bit by bit, the blood level is reflected by the clinical level. And the person taking the pills say, I can feel them working, and then I feel them stopping work. And they get motor fluctuations. And sometimes when it kicks in too high, they get those abnormal twisting movements that we call the dyskinesias. And this is after five years or so. Now the dopamine is still working. This is caused by the ongoing degeneration of the nerves in the Parkinson's. So you all have heard that the pills only last for five years. That's not true. The pills never stop working. It's just that the disease moves on and the pills have a harder time because they don't have the storage mechanism. So if you leave the pills till four and a half years, you'll only get half a year out of them before this starts to happening. This is a product of the progression of the disease, not the pills, which is why we no longer get people to wait and wait and wait and wait before we start them on the dopa, because we no longer believe that the pills stop working after a time. Now when the fluctuations start to get too much like this, we start to do a whole lot of other aspects of treatment. And from the medical, the pill point of view, we do a number of things to try to smooth out this. So we use slow release dopa like Cinemate CR. We use slow acting drugs like Ropinerol. We use drugs that stop the breakdown of levodopa like Tolcapone or Comtan, and all these things are doing the same thing, which is to try to smooth this out. And it works up to extent, but then bit by bit we can't keep up, and then we start moving towards invasive therapies. One of them is the injection under the skin called apomorphine, where we pump the drug in continually to try to make this curve into a flat curve. The other option that we've just a few people in New Zealand got is called Duodopa, where we put a tube in the belly and that we pump the levodopa in continually via a little pump system. And the third thing we do is that we can interrupt the cycle by deep brain stimulation, which is another, what's become a standard treatment for Parkinson's, where we drive a probe using a special um, guidance system down deep into the brain, and where we can connect the end of the probe to an electrical device under the skin, like a cardiac pacemaker, and what that does is it interrupts the cycle that makes the Parkinson's kick up and down, and we smooth it out. And we've had about 60 people, where's Lorraine? About 60 people have that in New Zealand. So it's not for everybody, but it's for some people with that kicking, <coughs> kicking Parkinson's. Now, just... So, I told you that Parkinson's is this complex mix one of the things that's worth recognizing is that the <coughs> old style Parkinson's that we used to talk about, just the stiffness and the slowness and the tremor, and the response to levodopa is very much a person at the young end of the disease, where people at the older end of the disease tend to have more trouble with the Lewy bodies all over the place, sort of thinking problems and, and sleep and pain and things like that. The problem with the fluctuations that I was telling you about, the up and down, could be fixed if we could get this storage back in place. So in that central part of the brain, if we could reconfigure a storage system which could either make its own dopamine or store the levodopa that comes from the tablets, we could get rid of the up and down, which is a major part of the problem for the younger people with Parkinson's disease. And this has led to this idea of so-called restorative treatment, which is the same as pretty much transplant treatment where we put something into that part of the brain that'll either make dopamine or store the dopamine we give in the form of pills and go from that up and down back to that honeymoon phase where there's a long, smooth response to levodopa. And there's been a whole bunch of research focused on that. 
and it's been focused mainly on what you put in. So we're very good at drilling holes in the skull and putting probes down in the brain. That's what we do all the time with the deep brain stimulation. But the idea is, could you inject something into that part of the brain that will store the dopamine and stop the fluctuations? And people have tried it with all sorts of things. Adrenal adala, the fetus from aborted tissues, uh, from pigs, from cells from the back of the eye. The colouring in the back of the eye is made out of dopamine. And of course stem cells, which gets so much news. There's ideas of injecting genes into that part of the brain to get the brain to make storage systems. And there's another idea, which we'll come back to in a moment, of stimulating that part of the brain to grow again. Now, this is something I've been involved in for the very long time. You, you might get a clue how long ago that was. <laughs> <coughs> this was, a photo was taken in uh, Vancouver in the late 1980s, where I went to work as a, a research fellow. And, and I just want to acknowledge tonight the help of the Neurological Foundation of New Zealand that uh, they have a, a fellowship called the Chapman Fellowship and it takes young neurologists who are heading down what's called a clinical career, uh, looking after patients, which is really important. But by funding them to uh, universities internationally, these young neurologists get taught research as well. And, and, and I want to acknowledge the Neurological Foundation. They gave me one of these Chapman Fellowships and I became a clinician researcher, which is a sort of a different career path, but it's why I've done research into Parkinson's ever since. So I went off to Vancouver and uh, joined a group uh, called, that does PET scanning. PET scanning stands for positon emission tomography. And what we would do is we'd take DOPA, the same stuff that's in the cinema, and put in a very weak radioactive label onto that and inject it into patients. And then they'd go into the scanner looked after by this whole team and what you can do is you can look at the accumulation of the dopamine in the, in the brain and it tells us uh, about certain aspects of how the Parkinson's uh, system is breaking down or not. And these are PET scans here. Now this was the first transplant work. Our own adrenal glands actually make dopamine. They make, uh, and dopamine is on the same pathway that includes adrenaline, and I've already told you it's on the same pathway that causes melanin. So the theory was you could take a person's adrenal gland out, find the dopamine part of the tissue, drill a hole in the skull, and pop the adrenal tissue in. Okay? And, it, and it's quite appealing. There's a couple of problems with that, and the main one is that it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why is that this is, Adrenal tissue, it doesn't want to be anything else, and it just stays there. And, uh, and so this is a PET scan of a person with pretty advanced Parkinson's, and after the transplant is a PET scan of a person with pretty advanced Parkinson's. But it was the first try. Now the second try was something very different, and it's got all sorts of ethical issues, but I'm not here to debate that, but, but I'm going to tell you that it works. And this is using the midbrain from an aborted human fetus, the part of that brain that is going to go on to become the substantia nigra and those Parkinson's nerves. Now, they, those nerves want to become dopamine nerves. They are, they've been programmed that way. And <clears throat> that's the PET scan on a patient before one of these transplants. They've got transplants both sides. And this one is the same person 12 months later, but uh, that's a normal PET scan. And I knew that person personally. I didn't do the transplant. This person had his transplant in Miami, and I was working up in the top left in Vancouver. But the patients used to come back to the PET unit that I worked at, because we were one of the only ones that did these studies. And we saw these patients go by. And they got a whole lot better. Now, you can stain for dopamine in the brain. And if you've got a normal brain, this part of the brain should be dark. If you've got Parkinson's, you don't see the dopamine that is pale. And this fellow, after he died, he had his pale part of the brain affected by Parkinson's and cause of tissue standing for dopamine, which is the transplanted tissue. So these patients improved. These patients, uh, uh, their PET scans got better, they clinically got better. He died from a completely different reason, but he donated his brain, and that's what they saw. 
But this is not a simple treatment and there's no way it's going to become standard treatment. And for a number of reasons that treatment stopped happening. But the point was proven that it is possible to do transplants into the brain and for it to work, but you've got to have the right tissue. And I'm not here to tell you that aborted fetus is the right tissue. But it started a whole stream of other research, including the idea of using tissue from other creatures. And the um, other thing I've got to tell you tonight, there's not much difference between us and pigs. <laughs> <laughs> and we've known that for years, haven't we? The first insulin came from pigs. Uh, we still use pig heart valves for heart trans for transplants. And so the idea is, well, if it worked from human fetus to humans with Parkinson's, what about pig fetus to humans? And that's okay in theory, but in practice, the system rejects foreign tissue like that. But when they did the study, down is good, over three, six, and nine months, the person with Parkinson's who had the pig cell transplants, it looked like they improved. But when the person, this person died from a different reason and they looked at the brain and hardly any of the pig cells had survived. And it turned out that the problem probably was that they selected people in such a way that it generated an artificial improvement. But it's a warning to everybody doing this sort of research study that in the early studies it can look like an improvement and lead you down the wrong direction. But when they went and did a double-blind placebo-controlled study, there was no improvement, and that whole idea petered out. But not completely. Interestingly, the fetal transplant work is uh, coming back, and it's coming back because a few patients had a really dramatic improvement. So 20 years on, some of these patients are still almost normal. Uh, some of them not even taking uh, medication. And, and so in Europe, a fetal transplant study is happening again, but they're still going to end up with the same problem, which is how do you generate this for general public use. So what do we know? We know that a very large number of people have had transplants into the striatum, that central part of the brain, of various sorts, uh, with a very good safety record. Hardly anybody's been hurt by this therapy, which gives us the ethical and, and uh, practical uh, confidence to try this if we could only find the right tissue. We also have to be very careful that pig study taught us a lesson that if you don't design the study properly you can fool yourself that it works when it hasn't. We know that the fetal transplants almost certainly work but uh, finding the tissue is so difficult that we're not going to go there. And we know that other transplant therapy shows some promise but nobody's proven that yet and it's important to design your studies properly. Now I want to change tack a little bit and bring it closer to the pig cell work. Now this is the rock star of neuroscience, uh, Rita Levi Monticelli. She was over a hundred when she was still doing original scientific work in the laboratory. She got a Nobel Prize and in Italy she was just a celebrity. They were like even more people in this room would come in here and talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she was stylish right up to the day she died. Now, she got her Nobel Prize for uh, discovering that we, something that we call growth factors, which are a really important part of the next part of the story. When you think of the brain forming, it's just a cluster of little cells, and as it gets more and more complicated, how on earth does this nerve know to join with that one? Just think about it. It's like throwing a bunch of wire in a box and stirring it up and getting a computer. <laughs> And the way nerves do this is that if a nerve wants that one to come, it releases something called a growth factor. And there are all sorts of growth factors and combinations, and these growth factors stimulate individual nerves to grow towards them. <clears throat> so this is the system that the brain uses to wire itself. It's like pulling itself up by the bootstraps. And uh, Rita, she was the one who discovered the first growth factors and got her Nobel Prize for that. And growth factors, uh, you can sort of think of them as fertilizers for neurons or the stimulation for them to grow. Now, this led to the idea that if we could put growth factors in that striatal part of the brain, could it get those nigro nerves that have died back with Parkinson's to start growing forward again? 
And in a laboratory rat, it certainly does. So you can make a laboratory rat Parkinsonian, put growth factors into the central part of the brain, and the nerves will grow back up again. If, you got, if you're a rat, we can guarantee to cure your Parkinson's. <laughs> <coughs> now, this led to a research study where they took one of this multitude of growth factors, there's so many of this, and they picked one called GDNF for various reasons, and they put a tube into the brain using that same technique that we use for deep brain stimulation, and a little reservoir under the skin, and we're giving patients injections of the growth factors into this reservoir to go into the brain. And the people, down is good, so up is bad Parkinson's, down is improving Parkinson's, and guess what? At 12 months, there was no improvement. So the green is the growth factor, the red is the uh, sham surgery, and, the, and you see that there's a, what, probably what we call a placebo effect, and so the study was abandoned for that and a number of other reasons. And then between 12 and 18 months, there was an improvement, but too late, the study was over. Okay? So this is a clue that, like in the rat, in humans, growth factors might work. But there are troubles with the study. Trouble number one, I've already told you, they didn't follow the patients long enough. Trouble number two is that the delivery system is really messy. The brain doesn't like tubes, the brain doesn't like regular injections of fluids. Excuse me. <coughs> and problem number three is that in this sort of study you can only use one growth factor, but we know you need a general garden fertilizer. You need a whole mix of growth factors to make our brain grow. But this is really encouraging. And the question is, would it be possible to put something in that part of the brain which releases growth factors, that doesn't need a tube and all the plumbing, and could that something release the whole mix of growth factors that we know is essential for nerves to grow? Now, there is a source of just that, and it's in the middle of our brain, so this would be a brain like ours. If you cut it across this way, there's cavities in the brain called the ventricles, and in the ventricles are a knot of blood vessels and, and cells called the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus in the absolute newborn is a factory for producing the whole mix of growth factors. And we know if you take a little bit of choroid plexus and get a petri dish and put it there and put nerves in another growth factor, they, in another um, hole in the dish, the nerves will avidly grow across the growth factors. That's the attraction I've been telling you about. We know it works. Now, if you thought about getting fetal tissue for a transplant, how are you going to get a choroid plexus donor? Almost impossible. We go back to our friend, the pig again. <laughs> He's already given us... Sorry. He's already given us his insulin and his heart valves. And the question is, could we take choroid plexus from a pig, a newborn pig, producing all these growth factors, and pop it into the brain? Well, we already know from that early pig research I showed you before that the first thing the brain will do is rev up its immune system and destroy it all. It'll be gone. So you need somehow to protect that transplanted tissue. Now one option would be strong immune suppression drugs, but those are quite dangerous. You know, we, still, we use them for heart and kidney transplants, but it would be very difficult to get good immune suppression to work. Now, possibly the answer to that comes from technology that was first developed in uh, Italy, but has now been used by LCT, the people who are paying for your scones tonight. Now, what this is, is an encapsulation technology using alginate, which is a seaweed extract. Each of these little bubbles is about half a millimeter in diameter. We've just seen them cross-section, but they're round. And inside them is a little bit of pig choroid plexus. And this alginate coating, if you look at it under electron microscope, is full of little holes. And the best way I think of it is like Gore-Tex, your Gore-Tex rain jacket, which lets vapour across, but otherwise protects you from the elements. And this membrane here, it stops the immune system getting in to attack those cells from the pig, and yet it's porous enough to let nutrients in, and it's porous enough to let growth factors out. And if you put these little round things inside the 
um, the brain or the body of a rat or another animal, they just survive and survive, protected from the immune system. Now, <clears throat> there's a second and possibly scarier problem with transplanting tissue from one species to another. It's like the bird flu phenomenon, you know. Flu lives quite happily in birds, but when it changes across into humans, it can be a nasty epidemic. And of course, part of New Zealand's story was like that. The, the, the British and American sailors who carried chicken pox and the flu around with, you know, an itch and a scratch and a sneeze, but not much more. But when it arrived in a community that wasn't immune to that, the Maori community, it caused terrible devastation. So one of the worries about pig transplant is particular viruses, particularly one called porcine endogenous retrovirus, and call it PIRV, <laughs> uh, and various other bugs in pigs that if they're transplanted into humans, in theory, could go wild. And for that reason, uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, transplanting live pig tissue into humans was actually banned around the world. And so this whole idea came to its knees. Now this is when the New Zealand story gets really interesting. That's New Zealand on the top, you can just see in Invercargill. And here are the Auckland Islands, the sub-Antarctic islands. And I haven't been there, and I'm not planning. Uh, so they're sort of windswept and cold. And in the early 1800s, Captain Abraham Bristow, the ship called Sarah, released a flock of pigs onto this island. And they've been there ever since. And these pigs have been living in isolation and they've bred the uh, ability to transmit these viruses out of themselves. So they've become a unique breed that can't transmit the PERV virus. Now these pigs are busy devastating the environment and so Doc announced that they were going to um, eradicate them and the Rare, Briggs, Rare Breed Society went down to the island and captured a bunch of them and brought them back to Invercargill. Now I did take this photo, so I've seen them here. A couple of these famous Auckland Island pigs relaxed, <laughs> confident in the knowledge that neither of them is a perv. <laughs> <coughs> now, pigs do several things when they're happy, including eat. And they were eating themselves out of house and home, and they were, the pigs were about to be killed or dispersed. And somebody came and saved them, and got into big trouble because he used his mayoral fund to do it. <laughs> It's, it's, a great, it's a great Kiwi story, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Who else but Tim Shadbolt would, uh, would use the Merrill funds to, to feed a bunch of pigs. But anyway, these pigs have survived, and some of them now live in isolation facilities uh, in New Zealand where they, are not, they can't come in contact with other creatures, and they've been tested and tested and remain free of these viruses. So between the encapsulation technique and the pig-free virus, we've now got the possibility of, uh, of developing a transplant therapy for Parkinson's, producing the growth factors. Making sense so far? Yes. Now, this whole process was developed by Bob Elliott, who is a, 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 a diabetes specialist, and his original plan was to take the pancreas of the pigs and transplant them into the belly of humans with uh, diabetes but using that same encapsulation technique. Quite different though, because he was hoping to transplant effectively a whole pancreas, which is thousands and thousands of these little capsules, whereas what we're trying to do is taking a little bit of choroid plexus and only transplant 40 or 80 or a couple of hundred. Quite a different scale. So there's, and, and he's done the diabetes research. Um, there's a limited amount you can learn from it, except for safety, but we have learned the safety story. And so 35 people have had this transplant for the diabetes. And what we know is that it didn't work so well for the diabetes, but we did know that this PERV virus wasn't transmitted and the people otherwise tolerated it well. So we got some safety information from that. Because often when you go into humans first time to do a new therapy, sure you've tried it on rats and mice and things like that, but there's always a sort of scary jump into humans. But we had some diabetic experience to guide us on. Now before you can devise a new therapy for something like Parkinson's, you have to try it on animal models. These are the rules. And so these little choroid plexus um, 
um, spheres or capsules taken from the pigs have been transplanted into animal models of disease. Uh, rats and monkeys with stroke, Huntington's disease and Parkinson's, unfortunately not the same disease. Uh, you may or may not be pleased to know that only humans get Parkinson's disease. There is no animal version of this disease, which means we don't have a good animal model. And the animal models that we do use are pretty poor models of the disease. In fact, so poor you can't read much into them except for tolerance and safety. So when you do this sort of research in Parkinson's, you have to get a clue that'll work, and you have to know as well as you can it's safe, and then you just have to take the step to see if it works in humans. But <clears throat> what models we have have been pretty dramatic, actually. And uh, this is a model of um, something called quinolinic acid. It's a model of Huntington's disease. There are two nerves left here. And the animal that's been protected with the little capsules, the nerves are quite happy and growing. This is some work that was done in Chicago using the, um, the little capsules that I've been telling you about. This is some work with monkeys. And the same graphs I'm going to show you over and over. Down is good. So over the weeks after transplantation, there's no improvement with just um, a, a, a cannulous track in the brain or just the empty capsules. But if the capsules have got these choroid plexus cells, you get this sort of improvement. And look at that curve, because we're going to come back to it soon. <coughs> so, I'm hoping I've convinced you, because we managed to convince MedSafe, <laughs> that there is, have been many transplant studies for Parkinson's using all sorts of tissues. That pig cells have been used before in Parkinson's. We know that they didn't survive, but we sure know that they didn't cause particular harm. We know that growth factor studies have been done before, and I showed you that GDNF one where they started to improve after 18 months. We know that people already accept burr holes and brain probes for deep brain stimulation. That when you go to what we call a double blind study, that sham surgery is well established. So you drill a little hole just in the surface of the brain, so if a person reaches up, they think, well, is there a hole or not? And they don't know. It keeps them honest. That's the doctors, I mean, and the nurses. We know that the um, that the encapsulation technique using diabetic cells, or the pancreas cells, works uh, is safe in diabetes. And we know that in animal models of Parkinson's and other neurological disorders, the animals improve with the transplants. And we know that these cells are safe in animals. So it was this body of information that we took to the regulatory authorities, all the way up to the Minister of Health, and all sorts of checks in between, to get permission to do the first studies in humans. Now, there's two teams involved. Uh, the most important teams are the patients, and there were four of them, and they're anonymous, mostly, and that's how we like it. And then there's the group of uh, clinicians. So there's Lorraine in the back. Uh, Hugh was our first psychologist. We had a few psychologists in the study. Mr. Bock, the surgeon, uh, Dr. Fanukin, the psychiatrist, and Dr. McCauley, and Dr. Simpson, and a slightly younger Dr. Snow. So that's the, the core group that does a study. And I've said before, I'll say it again, this is a team sport. What we did then, and some of you will remember, is the next step we did is after assembling the team, is actually we went to the Parkinson Society and gave a talk and asked the question, do you want to be involved in this? Because this is the first in humans, it's a risk, but it's your business. And I have to say, if you'd said no, we would have stopped. But you didn't, so we carried on. Um, this study has got more checks and balances than anything you could imagine. So MedSafe, the Minister of Health, we have Ethics, we have a research committee at Auckland Hospital, we have an international group of advisors who follow the study, we have something called the Data Safety and Monitoring Board who keeps an eye on us all the way through, and um, we have no conflict of interest, which means that we're not allowed to get paid for doing this. So. Um, which is why we're going to be charging you for tickets for tonight's talk. <coughs> and this is an MRI from one of the four folk who got the first transplants. Um, that little wee sort of messy bit up there is where the hole was drilled in the skull. This is where the needle went down, it's left a scar, and you can see the little clumps of cells. There's 40 cells, sorry, 40 cells all clumped up in there. And then we followed these people in two ways. One is with the PET scans I told you about before. 
and they went to Vancouver and back two times for that. And that was hard work and we did it, but I have to say I admire the folk and their family who did it. We also followed them clinically. And we got two results which we're still puzzling over. The first is the PET scans didn't improve. But we did them at six months and we've been left wondering all sorts of things. Should we have done them at 12 and 18 months? The second thing we saw was uh, quite a striking improvement in their Parkinson's. Remember I've been showing you the animal and other studies which is down as good? So the dotted line is where everybody was at the beginning and with Parkinson's you generally expect it to slowly get worse but the black line is the average and one of our folk is out to 132 months now which is getting on to what? Quite a long time. <laughs> and so we've seen a, a, an improvement which has been sustained. And this is an improvement in the Parkinson's. And what we do is we bring people in in the morning off their pills and look at their Parkinson's in an untreated state. And then we give them their medication and they turn on and they often become dyskinetic. But the dyskinesia is also improved uh, and a state improved as well. Now, these improvements are big enough to see, but not big enough to make the person normal by any means. But it's about, well, it's a lot more than we expected. It's about half of what you'd expect with just pills alone, but these people are still taking their pills. The other measure that we've looked at is the, what's called a PDQ, which is a general assessment of how a person's getting on. And a lot of criticism of these studies is, I don't care if the trim's more or less, is the person managing their life better? And with some variation, but we're still seeing that same improvement. Now, you have to be really careful with over-interpreting this sort of data. Uh, this is an open-label study, only four people, and we know that in other studies there's been initial improvement with sort of later disappointment. And so we've been very careful to just keep watching and watching and watching these folks, which is why we didn't stop the study way back here like they did in the other ones, is why we're keeping watch. But this has been enough improvement to, think, to make us recognise that there could be something in here. So what are we doing next? <clears throat> well, the first, as I said, is long-term follow-up. We're, we're doing our best to stay on good terms with the folk who've had the transplants and just to keep watching and watching to make sure they're looked after properly but also to see what happens. We also have started on another study that the Ministry of Health have given us permission to do. Instead of doing one side, like in the first people, we're doing two sides. We are concentrating on younger patients, less than 65, because there's some evidence that the younger people would respond better than older people and with a shorter duration of disease. And we're also dividing the groups into groups with bigger doses each time to try to find the perfect dose. And to keep everybody honest, a small proportion of the patients will have sham surgery, which is that little burr hole, because that way neither the person or the studying group knows what's happened until we finally break the code, and that will keep us honest. And so we've launched down that pathway where we are doing what's called a phase two study. The first is phase one, the second is phase two. Now people ask me all the time, well does it work? And my answer is, well if we knew it worked we wouldn't have to do the research. We know that there's enough information in the background to make us really interested. We know that the people responded clinically in a way that they would if it worked. So we don't have a strong reason to say it doesn't, but we've learned to control ourselves and just uh, methodically work our way through study after study, which is what we're doing now. So that's where we're up to with the science. You've heard me uh, thank uh, uh, the other people in the whole Parkinson's team, Parkinson's Society, the nurses, but I just want to remind everybody that actually this is your disease. And I just want to point out that no advance or discovery in Parkinson's, whether it was levodopa, whether it was deep brain stimulation or this, was done without Parkinson's folk saying, I want to do something for my disease, I'm going to take a personal risk. Now this is uh, Shackleton's ad in the London Times. A lot of you know this, don't you? This is what he wrote in the Times. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, 
constant danger, safe return doubtful, honour and recognition in case of success. Ernest Shackleton. Isn't that the best? <laughs> and, and I just want to sort of take my hat off and show you my burr holes, but take my hat off to the people involved in research, that first four folk who put up their hands and done it, the next six folk in this current group, the next six after the next six after that, because what they're actually doing is uh, something for everybody. And we talk a lot about the difference between hope and expect. If somebody comes into a research study like this expecting an improvement, uh, we just say, don't come. But you're allowed to hope like the rest of us, because it may or may not work. It, you probably won't get cold. But I just want to leave you with one other quote. How, when we lived in Canada, we kind of watched this. And, and this is probably the greatest ice hockey player who ever played, Wayne Gretzky. And he said the following, that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So we've been given the opportunity to study this tissue. Uh, we've, I've told you the background and the rationale for it, and we're taking that shot. Uh, so far it's looking okay, but we haven't scored a goal yet. Um, but that's where we're heading. So, hey, thank you very much for your attention tonight. I'm sorry about the crowd and the parking and all this and the dermatologist next door, but uh, <laughs> thanks for your attention. And I'm quite happy to take questions now and then outside afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Give the questions. You ask the questions. Yeah. 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 So for those who didn't hear that it is being filmed and recorded and evidently it is going to be put onto the Parkinson site, so just keep out a look out for that. Anyone else got any? Down the back there? Yep. Uh, less than 65. Uh, 65, uh, you can be 65 when you consent. Okay. Yeah. 65 or less. Isn't that terrific? That's young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for some years in Carrington Psychiatric Hospital, which is now the Polytech. Now I've got Parkinson's, had it 10 years, and I'll obviously use myself to test what's going on inside myself. Um, Neurologically, as it were, from a chaplain's and a psychologist's point of view, what's happening in New Zealand from the psychologist, the psychoneurologist? Yeah, um, this is. You're right. So the question is, what about the psychoneurology of Parkinson's? And this is one of those things that we recognise when we move from that old understanding of the disease to the new. And I think everybody with Parkinson's and those around them will tell you that people with Parkinson's don't think quite the same. It doesn't mean they don't think well, but they just think differently. And probably the most striking feature that people notice is they can't multitask very well. And there's quite a lot of research being done about that uh, by Professor Anderson's group in Christchurch, where they're looking at MRI scans and giving uh, folks certain tasks before and after and looking at the pattern of how they change and, and looking seriously at ways of cognitively training people. So your question, is there research being done on it? And the answer is absolutely. And, uh, but most of it has been done, some in Auckland and but Christchurch as well. The Vidopa, how can they improve it? How can they improve levodopa? Um, once levodopa is in the brain, I'm sure you can't improve it, because that's the natural compound. We can improve it by getting it to be stored longer in the brain, and that's probably what this is all about. But the main thing that needs to be improved is getting it from the gut into the brain, because it's an amino acid, it just gets broken down. Only about 3% of what you swallow gets to the brain. And probably the next big advance in levodopa will be ways of encapsulating the dopa so it doesn't get broken down in the stomach, so more of it's available and more consistently available to get to the brain. Mm. And that's coming. Mm. What sort of exercise? Um, yeah, the question is what sort of exercise? And the answer is we don't really know actually. We don't know what sort of exercise, whether it's aerobic or resistance, and we don't know the dose either. 
so we've got a couple of rules of thumb. The first is an obvious one, which is the part you exercise gets better. <laughs> so it's good to incorporate balance and particular thigh strength because that's what stops you falling over. Um, as far as the dose goes, uh, I was sort of teasing you about that a little bit more before, is, is not so much exercising but it's continuing to exercise. So the dose is the amount that you can do again tomorrow. Mm. In other words, keep it up. Mm. On tremors? Yeah, tremor is, is the oddest thing. Tremor doesn't, is the odd one out in the Parkinsonian physical symptoms. Uh, it doesn't get necessarily worse as the disease goes on. It sometimes even improves. And frustratingly, it's the symptom that often responds least well to medication. And it's probably because tremor is a natural state. We've got systems in our brain to stop tremor coming out. So in other words, we've all got oscillators in there but there's systems to stop it coming out. And so it's, a, it's an in or out phenomenon. It escapes or it doesn't, and you've got it or it doesn't. Now, now I know that some people respond to medication with a tremor, but a lot don't. So for these reasons, it tremors the odd one out, and we often, it's the one that we have most trouble treating. Before you complain too much though, tremor predominant Parkinson's, it tends to be more benign than the version that doesn't have it. So, you know, with every bad bit, you get a good bit, but yeah, the tremor can be hard to treat. Until you get to the point of deep brain stimulation, it responds nicely to deep brain stimulation. But we generally don't do DBS for tremor alone. Every now and again we do, when it's really bad, but, but not always, yep. Just because of that, on the deep brain stimulation, is it true that they say that you really only has a effective life for about five years? Yeah, so here's that old question again, it only lasts five years. No, that's not true. Pretty well all the treatments for Parkinson's last, for what it's treating, is when the disease moves on, it may no longer be good for the next phase. And so that's got an important implication, which is that we've in the past we've made the mistake of putting things off. It's like leaving the money in the bank until the day you need it. Well, by the day you need it, the money is kind of it's foreign currency, it doesn't work anymore, you know? And so so I think I'd be spending my Euros now if I was in Europe, you know. <laughs> in five years they may not work anymore. And so um, no, they don't last five years. In fact, the people with deep brain stimulation 20 and 30 years on are still working. I thought what we might do now is stop because some people have to go, and, and, but I'm going to stay around if you've got any more questions for me. So I'll let you all go.